I just want to say thank you so much, Tim, for an incredible contribution. Yeah. 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 It's so awesome to, to hear uh, just uh, your, your, your heart and, and even just your faith and, and courage uh, to do what's right. Uh, sometimes the Lord blesses and sometimes the Lord tests. And sometimes the blessing comes after the test. And uh, I do believe that God will definitely bless you when you do what's right in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, if you're wondering why we, we didn't take communion this morning, it, it's because uh, we're going we're gonna to take our communion right at the end of our sermon this morning. And uh, it is, in my opinion, quite fitting because the title of our lesson this morning is Take Up Your Cross. Take Up Your Cross. Let's uh, be opening our Bibles to Luke chapter 9 and verse 18. Luke chapter 9. Hopefully you came this morning ready to take up your cross. Hopefully if you've been carrying your cross, you haven't dropped the cross. But ultimately, we're going to be challenged this morning from the scriptures to do exactly what Jesus did. That Jesus and his life ended up on the cross. In Luke chapter 9 and verse 18, the Bible says, Once when Jesus was praying in private, he and his disciples were with him. He asked them, who do the crowd say I am? They replied, well, some say John the Baptist and others say Elijah. Still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, well, you're God's Messiah. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. And he said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders of the chief priests and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. You know, right here, when we find an essential scripture in helping people to understand what, what it truly means to be a real Christian or a real disciple. And as Jesus was walking around right here, the Bible says that he spoke to them all, meaning that there was a crowd that was following Jesus. And if you can imagine, Jesus always had a crowd that was with him. They wanted to see the miracles. They wanted to see the spectacle that was Jesus. And so Jesus has this large following and he turns to them all and he says, hey, if you really want to be a Christian, if you really want to be a disciple, you got to deny yourself and take up your cross daily and follow me. You know, we understand that this was Jesus' standard back in the first century. And we understand that this is Jesus' standard in the 21st century. That the times may change, the culture may change, but the standard of God never changes. You know, it's amazing to me is that, uh, you know, sometimes as a, a, an older Christian, you, you tend to read certain versions of stories in the Bible, and, and you kind of just move past the other accounts of the same, same stories. And I was reading this, and I was studying this out, and it, it occurred to me that Matthew and Mark both record something that Luke leaves out. And so turn with me to Matthew chapter 16. In Matthew 16, starting in verse 21, here's Matthew's account of the same exact story or the same exact moment where Jesus was speaking to the large crowds and laying out what it really meant to be a disciple. And starting in verse 21, it says, From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up his cross and follow me. You know, again, Jesus is explaining to his disciples that he was going to have to go to the cross. That, that his life, as great as it was, was going to end up in Jerusalem on a cross. And as he's, been, as he's sharing this, Peter pulls Jesus aside and he has a conversation that you should really never have with Jesus. He starts to rebuke the Messiah. 
He goes, never, Lord. This shall never happen to you. You know, even from the very beginning, and even with Jesus, we see that other people will always try to hold you back from the cross. And yet Jesus looks at Peter, but he doesn't just see Peter. He sees the force that was influencing Peter. And so he says, get behind me, Satan. You see, sometimes we can look at people's words as if they're coming from the person themselves. But truth be told is that sometimes we're being influenced by spiritual forces that we don't see or understand. And Jesus looked at Peter and he goes, this is not something that came from you, Peter. This is something that came from Satan himself. Because I know I have to go to the cross, but not only me. You see, he goes on right here, and this is what I never caught before. In verse 24, it doesn't say that Jesus said to them all. It says that Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up the cross and follow me. You see, sometimes Jesus spoke to the crowds and laid out what it meant to be a Christian. And sometimes Jesus even spoke to his disciples and had to remind them what it meant to be a disciple. And right here, he looks at his disciples and he goes, look, if you really want to be a disciple, you got to take up your cross and follow me. You see, at the end of the day, sometimes as disciples, it's easy just to assume that because we're Christians, we're carrying the cross. But all of us, from time to time, can drop our cross. And Peter right here dropped his cross. And so Jesus goes, look, if you really want to be a disciple, you got to take up your cross and follow me. You know, this morning, I just want to ask you, have you been carrying your cross? Have you been carrying your cross? Or maybe you're not a Christian. Maybe you're debating whether or not you should take up your cross. And I want to encourage you, I want to inspire you, but ultimately I want to challenge you to take up this mantle of Christianity this morning and take up your cross to be a disciple of Jesus. You know, this charge right here of Jesus to take up our cross is recorded in all four of the gospel accounts. We've already read Luke's account and Matthew's account. Mark more or less says the same thing. But if we can, please turn over to John chapter 12. And this will be our main text for this morning. John chapter 12 and verse 20. Once again, we find more or less the same circumstance. And Jesus really calling his disciples to imitate his faith and to imitate his conviction and commitment to the cross. And I simply have three points this morning. I'm just going to break it down for you right here. Number one, my first point is crucified to glorify. Number two, crucified to multiply. And number three, crucified to testify. John chapter 12, verse 20. The Bible says, Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship the festival that came to Philip, who was from Bethesda in Galilee, with a request. Certainly so said, We would like to see Jesus. Philip went to Andrew, and Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, and anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. You know, right here, as Jesus prepares to go to the cross, one of the things that, that hits me or strikes me is in verse 23, he says, the hour has come for the Son of Man not to be crucified, but to be glorified. You see, Jesus right here refers to his crucifixion as a time of glorification. He saw it as an opportunity for him to be glorified in his obedience to God. But he also saw it as an opportunity to glorify God himself. 
And so he goes on to say, well, what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this hour I came, Father, glorify your name. You know, going to the cross for Jesus was not something he tried to duck away from. He wasn't trying to live a challenge-free, easy-peasy Christianity. Jesus understood that God is not glorified by the absence of hardship, but by the presence of grit in the heart of a disciple. You know, a lot of times it's easy for us as disciples to say the first part of Jesus' statement. Father, save me from this hour. And don't we sometimes go through different hardships that we pray those prayers? God, save me from this bill that came in the mail. God, save me from my professor. He made a mistake and now I got to go take it to him. Please save me from this professor. God, save me from my kids. You know, all of us who have young kids, we pray that prayer pretty often. God, save me from these children. I know you love them and I'm trying my hardest to love them. But here's the fact. God never promised to save us from hardship. He simply promised to save us from sin. And part of saving us from sin means not saving us from hardship. Do you with me right here? That, that God understands that we have to go through hardship to grow in our character. And God uses hardship. He uses pain to mold us so that we can become more and more like Jesus. And oftentimes we, 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 we fight it. We don't like that feeling of hardship. We don't like that feeling of pain. It's so easy for us as disciples to drop our crosses. You know, this past week at Men's Midweek, I, I, I shared something with the guys because, you know, a lot of, a lot of us have been out through various sicknesses and, and illnesses. And it is that time of the year where things get a little colder and everybody gets sick. And, and then I found out that Jake's never been sick. And so I assumed that it was really Jake who is the host of the virus, that he's just the carrier. <laughs> And he passed it on to the rest of us. But, but we've all gotten sick or ill. And, and you know, it's hard to, to kind of move on and push through when you're sick. But I shared a scripture with the guys on Wednesday from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, where the Bible says, join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. You see, in the Bible, we are absolutely the family of God. But also in the Bible, we are the army of God. And the Bible calls us to be soldiers for Christ. Now, I don't know about you. I've never been in a war. But I would imagine that if you're fighting a physical battle, if you're in a war, and you get the sniffles, your commanding officer is not going to be cool with you going and sleeping in the barracks. You with me right here, guys? That if you get the sniffles, you got to fight through. Now, granted, you get a leg blown off, then go to the triage and get yourself taken care of. You with me here, guys? But, 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 but we've got to have a little bit of grit right here. We understand that God calls us to evangelize the world. And if we're going to be the group that does just that, we're going to have to push through hardship. We're going to have to embrace suffering, and we're going to have to make sure we don't drop our cross. We need to make sure that we are committed to being crucified to glorify. You know, a, a while back, I'll never forget, I was, I was looking up the scripture because, you know, we all, we're all familiar with the story of Jesus carrying his cross to Golgotha where he was crucified. And we're all familiar that as he was carrying his cross, he fell because the cross was too heavy. And so they had to get Simon and Cyrene to come help, help him carry the cross. Well, I was trying to find that story in the Bible. And what I realized is that that story does not exist in the Bible. Yeah, yes, Simon did carry the cross of Jesus, but the Bible does not actually record that Jesus fell when he was carrying the cross. That, that's something that later on the Catholic Church added as tradition. And so it's been held by most people that Jesus fell. But it's not recorded anywhere in the scriptures. I mean, I spent like an hour looking for it. And then finally I did some research and found it's not in there. And I think that there's a point in and of that, just in itself, that, that Jesus never fell under the weight of the cross. That Jesus never dropped the cross. That Jesus never failed to carry his cross physically and metaphorically. But I do think there's some things to learn. Turn with me to, to Mark, chapter, chapter 15, verse 21. Mark, chapter 15. 
in verse 21. Here's Mark's account. It says a certain man of Cyrene, Simon, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way and from the country, and they forced him to carry the cross. They brought Jesus to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Then they offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him, dividing up his clothes. They cast lots to see what each would get. It was nine in the morning when they crucified him. The written notice of the charge against him read, the king of the Jews. You know, here we find the physical account where Jesus literally carried his cross. And we understand at this point it was only 9 a.m. in the morning, and so we know that Jesus was kept awake the entire night as he was being tortured, beaten with whips, crown of thorns shoved into his scalp, being hit repeatedly, beaten with rods, being mocked, made fun of. And he gets up at 9 a.m. in the morning, and now he's being forced to carry this huge wooden beam on his back, the 600-meter journey from where he was crucified or whipped to Golgotha, where he would be crucified. You know, the Bible doesn't record that Jesus fell, but it does appear that the Romans felt like Jesus wasn't moving quick enough. And so they decided to force this guy, Simon of Cyrene, to help Jesus carry the cross. You know, I think there's three things that we can learn from this story of Jesus physically carrying his cross. Number one, you can't drop the cross, but you can ask for help. You can't drop the cross, but you can ask for help. You know, I think it's amazing that Jesus, even though he was the Son of God, and had all the power that came with him being the Son of God, still needed someone to help him to carry the cross. And I think for us, sometimes we can have so much ego when it comes to letting other people help us. That we don't want to tell anybody our issues. We don't want to tell anybody our problem. We don't want to confess our sin to anybody, tell anybody our, our hearts, because we're, we're afraid that they might look down on us as they help us. You know, I never forget the, the movie Lord of the Rings. That very last scene where Sam and Frodo were together and Frodo did not have the strength to take the ring and throw it over the cliff. And so Sam, as the friend he was, goes, I'll do it. I'll, I'll take the ring. And Frodo looks at Sam and he goes, you can't carry the ring. And Sam looks back at Frodo and says, I cannot carry the ring, but I can carry you. And he picks him up, takes him to the edge, and Frodo throws the ring over the side. You know, I really want to lift up and appreciate uh, Jake and Megan. You know, this past week, uh, my wife and I got into a little bit of an argument. And you know how that's, that's kind of where it starts? And then it kind of turns into bad attitudes. And that eventually turns into not really talking to each other, just kind of dealing with things. And then we had D time on Thursday night where we were supposed to go over and help Jake and Megan. And so we went over to Jake and Megan's place to, to disciple and help and encourage Jake and Megan. And we were there for a couple hours and we were hanging out and we were, we were pretty encouraged. And then Jake goes, well, how are you guys doing? You know, my wife shared that Kelly had shared some things about things you guys were going through. You guys didn't share anything earlier, but how are you guys doing? I go, oh boy. Here we go. <laughs> and it was great because we got some discipling. Kelly and I were able to work things out and get resolved. But at the end of it, they stayed up till 2 a.m. in the morning to help us get resolved. You with me? Yeah. And I really appreciate that. Because they weren't going to let me not get resolved. <laughs> that they saw that we were having hardship and they helped us. But there was something inside of us that we didn't really want to help. And I think that a lot of us feel that from time to time. We don't want people to help us. We don't want people to look down on us. We don't want to share our egos, get hurt. And we don't want people to help us. But even Jesus had somebody help him carry the cross. And I think we've got to learn that if Jesus needed help, we are all going to need some help from time to time. Number two, numbing out is always a temptation when going to the cross. You know, it's amazing right here. As Jesus was going through all this pain, remember he had been beaten the night before, he wakes up, now he's carrying this giant wooden beam on his back, and they offer him wine mixed with myrrh, which is basically like a painkiller. 
And the Bible says that Jesus did not take any. You know, I think part of that is because Jesus, I think, wanted to rely fully on God's strength and not the strength of anything else in going to the cross. But, but I think, secondly, whenever we're going through hardship, it's so easy to find things that numb us out to the hardship. It's so easy for us to find, quote unquote, painkillers in the form of things like Netflix or the busyness of life or our careers or things to do, things to preoccupy our minds. And what can happen, because sometimes we just numb out spiritually, is we try to push through as disciples, but we turn into spiritual cyborgs. Where we don't have any emotion behind our relationship with God. There's no fire, there's no zeal. We're just doing things because we're supposed to. But we're in pain inside. And we come to church and the song leaders sing, but we don't really sing and give our hearts because we're just spiritual cyborgs. We've been numbing out all week. Instead of really dealing with the attitudes, the issues, and the things that we're feeling on the inside. You know, Jesus didn't numb out. You know, we live in, in a society where pain and, and discomfort are preached against. Yeah. That, that, that we're not supposed to, in our minds, experience any sort of pain or hardship. And if you are experiencing some kind of pain or hardship, then something's wrong with you. You need to go see a medical professional or a psychiatrist, get prescribed something, and that'll make you so you're pain-free. But, but here's a fact, and I really want us to have a deep conviction on this. Pain is just a fact of life. Pain is a fact of life. Now, that's true if you're a Christian, and that's even true if you're a non-Christian. You're going to be in pain if you're a Christian, and you're going to be in pain as a non-Christian. You're going to just choose which kind of pain you want to be in. You with me here? But as a disciple, pain is a fact of life. That when you become a disciple, life does not get easier. In some ways, it gets harder. Now, it's very fulfilling. It's exciting to be a disciple. It's exciting to have a relationship with God. On the other hand, it's going to involve pain. And in some ways, we've got to learn that pain is all part of the process. You know, in Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 8, the Bible says that Jesus learned obedience from what he suffered. You know, we don't, we don't really learn to obey whenever things are good. That's when it's easy to obey. I mean, when God gives you straight A's, isn't it easy to be fired up about God? It's when it's tough, when life gets hard, when you don't have any money, when you lost your job, and you still have to be a disciple, that's when the true test of a Christian occurs. Are you going to obey in spite of the pain? Not because things are easy. And yet, and yet so often, we can numb out through entertainment, through busyness, through relationships, instead of turning back to Jesus for the strength to fight our pain. Thirdly, I think the third thing we can learn here is you never know how God will be glorified, only that he will. You know, Jesus right here is carrying the cross, and randomly, the Romans select this guy, Simon of Cyrene, to help Jesus carry the cross. And the Bible records right here that he's the father of Alexander and Rufus. Well, you know, a lot of people don't understand this, but when somebody's name is written in the Bible, it's usually for two reasons. Number one is they became a disciple and did something really awesome for God. Or number two is they're just extremely wicked. I mean, that's the only two things that would get your name in the Bible. And so everybody who's listed in the Bible is either extremely wicked or extremely awesome right here. Well, Simon, we know, carries the cross with Jesus. But let's go to Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16, verse 13. Here Paul is speaking to the church there in Rome. And in verse 13, he's, he's sending all his final greetings and salutations. And he says right there, greet Rufus. Chosen in the Lord and his mother, who's been a mother to me, too. You know, a lot of scholars believe that Simon of Cyrene ends up becoming a Christian. His two sons, Alexander and Rufus, end up becoming a Christian. And even Simon's wife ends up becoming a Christian. Now, most likely, Simon and Alexander are not mentioned here because they've already died. But Paul goes, man, greet Rufus. He's an awesome disciple. And you know what? His mom, Simon of Cyrene's wife is a mother in the faith to me too. Now, you got to admit, 
If you're the mother in the faith to the Apostle Paul, you're pretty darn cranky. <laughs> you with me right here? And so it's amazing. Here Jesus is. He's carrying his cross. And somewhere along the line, as he's carrying his cross, Simon comes and joins him. And they walk together that 600-meter journey to Golgotha. And in that time, they would have had a time where they would talk. Or maybe even not even with words. Jesus would communicate what it meant to be a disciple to Simon. And Simon would leave so blown away by that, that he would become a true Christian. You see, you never know how God's going to work it out. You never know how God's going to be glorified. You only know that he will when you choose to carry your cross. Crucified to glorify. Number two, crucified to multiply. Let's go back to John 12. John 12 and verse 24. The Bible says, very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Right here, Jesus is not only predicting his death, predicting also the end result of what would happen if he were to go through with his crucifixion. And he refers to this as the dying of a kernel of wheat. Now, uh, I don't know if it's biologically or ge geologically or whatever it is. But when a kernel of wheat drops, the outer husk of that wheat literally has to die. And as it dies, it, it feeds the germ within that seed, nutrients, which allow that seed to sprout, producing a bigger stock of wheat which will eventually lead to more and more seeds of wheat. And so we understand that Jesus right here is calling us to be crucified, to multiply. You know, never forget, there's a brother in L.A. His name is uh, Vic Sr. Some of us know him. He's quite the character. And uh, we, were, we were having this big workshop, and, and he got up and he had a five-minute charge to do, and his, his charge was on the scripture. And I'll never forget, he, again, quite a character. And so he, he got up in front of the whole group. I mean, there's probably hundreds and hundreds of guys, just a men's group. And he, he's got an apple with him, and he's got a big machete. I mean, when somebody starts preaching with an apple and a machete, you start paying attention. And he gets up, and he's just up in front of everybody like this. And he goes, okay, guys, I got a question for you. How many of you know how many seeds are in this apple? And, of course, all the brothers think they know the answer. And so they're shouting out different numbers, uh, six seeds, uh, eight seeds, 12 seeds. 37 seats. And so he goes, okay. Cuts the apple in half. I mean, he didn't just like cut it in half. You're like, douche. Cuts the apple in half. And he opens it up. And I'll never forget, because we're all excited to see how many seeds are in this apple. He goes, you know, it doesn't matter how many seeds are in an apple. It only matters how many apples are in a seed. You know, I think for us, we've got to understand. It doesn't matter how great of a disciple, only how many disciples can we produce if we allow ourselves to crucify, to multiply. You with me right here? Turn it to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. You know, one of the questions that I think gets asked from time to time is, you know, we're, we're privileged as North Americans to have the scriptures, to have the Bible. But what happens to those that don't have the Bible or don't have the scriptures? How, how does God judge those without God's commands? Well, right here in Romans chapter 2 and verse 12, Paul says, all who sin apart from the law will also perish apart from the law. So we'll start right there. And we know just from this early statement that there is such a thing as sin apart from the law. So those that have the Bible, that don't live out the Bible, are sinners like you and I. But, but those that don't have the Bible are equally sinful. Just because they don't know doesn't mean that they're not sinful. You with me? Let's keep reading. Verse 13. He says, For it is not those who hear the law who are righteous in God's sight, but it is those who obey the law who will be declared righteous. Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves even though they do not have the law. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, 
their consciences also bearing witness and thoughts sometimes accusing them and at other times even defending them. This will take place on the day when God judges people's secrets through Jesus Christ as my gospel declares. What's Paul saying right here? He's saying for those that have the law, we're going to be judged by the law. And so if you have a Bible, if you have an opportunity to read the scriptures, then ultimately we're going to be judged by the scriptures. And so we've got to make sure that we're really following the Bible. doesn't matter what people's opinions say. It doesn't matter what you feel. Ultimately, you've got to make sure you're following the scriptures. But what he says, those that don't have the Bible, they're not going to be judged by the Bible. Is that awesome right there? You go, man, I wish I didn't have the Bible. <laughs> Th things would just be a lot easier without the Bible. I wish my mom never shared this with me. But here's the thing. He says that those that don't have the Bible, though they're not going to be judged by the Bible, they're going to be judged by their consciences. That God has ultimately put his standards into our hearts. And so even though we don't have the Bible, we all have a conscience. And that conscience is going to either convict us or defend us. You with me right here? Now, now here's the thing. How many of us have ever perfectly lived up to the Bible? I, I'm glad that some of you find that pretty funny. But how many of us have ever lived up to our conscience? You see, whether you're trying to live by the Bible and fail, or you try to live up to your conscience and fail, all men are sinful. And so we go to Romans chapter 3, starting verse 21. It says, but now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law of the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There's no difference between Jew and Gentile. It doesn't matter if you have the Bible or don't have the Bible. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. You see, I believe that the only answer for the entire world, for every problem that the world faces, is Jesus. Yeah. I, I really believe that. The only answer, the only solution to change the world is Jesus. For the Gentile and for the Jew, for those that have the scriptures and for the many that don't. Jesus is the only answer. You know, for the last uh, three or four months or so, I, I've, been, I've been Ubering on the weekends to earn a little extra money for missions. And, uh, you know, it's funny, I'm from the States, and so naturally in our, our car rides, when people have conversations with me, somehow it always kind of gets to, where are you from? And I share with them, oh, I'm from the States, and, and inevitably the, the question that follows that is, oh, what do you think of Donald Trump? I mean, every single time, I could predict it every single time. And I already know it's coming. And so because it's such a big question and so many people have asked it, I thought I'd just clear that up for you guys this morning. What do I think about Jesus or Donald Trump? You already know what I think about Jesus. What do I think about Donald Trump? It's very simple. He's not Jesus. That's what I think. He's not Jesus. And if you're thinking that Donald Trump or President Obama or anybody else is going to change the world, it's not Jesus, you're sadly mistaken. Jesus is the answer to the world's problems. It isn't about government. It's not about your education. It's not about fighting wars. It's not about programs and things and hospice care, whatever it is. It's about bringing Jesus to the world. And when Jesus is brought to the world and people become disciples and those disciples make other disciples who make other disciples who make other disciples who make politicians into disciples who make people that are non-believers into disciples when they make disciples of all nations then Jesus can be brought to the world and the world can be changed. But are you willing to be crucified? Are you willing to go to the cross? You see, my Bible says that unless a kernel of wheat dies, it remains a single seed. It has to die to make other seeds. You know, I have a deep conviction that the world is lost. That there's not many people out there that are really teaching what it means to be a disciple. And I know this because I've met a lot of them. I've studied the Bible with religious people. I've studied the Bible with non-religious people. And I can tell you, this message is not preached. It is not preached. 
The standards of Christianity have dropped. Most people don't even know that the word Christian and the word disciple are one and the same in the Bible. Yeah. Most people think that a Christian is just somebody who shows up to church on Sundays and believes in God, is a part of a, quote, Christian family, and they were somehow born into Christianity. But in the Bible, in Acts chapter 11, verse 26, we find that the word Christian and the word disciple are just the same thing. Two different words to describe the same thing. And unless we live like the disciples of the first century, unless we do what the disciples of the first century did, then, then, then we're not really being Christians. We're not really being disciples. And so few people know that truth. And I think for us as disciples, one of our challenges is not to get sentimental with the truth. You know, it's hard to accept that sometimes people die and that they're not saved. And it's particularly hard for us as Christians to accept that sometimes even our family members die and that they're not saved. And it's so easy for us when those things happen for us to look at the standard and try to change the standard to change the reality. But the reality does not change the standard. The standard stays the same regardless of what's happening in life. You know, a few weeks back, my wife had a conversation with her mom. And uh, her mom at one point was a disciple, uh, but shortly thereafter fell away. And she's gone through a number of different life challenges, and from time to time she's shown interest in coming back and being a disciple again, but she, she's currently not a disciple. And that is as clear as me and Kelly sitting right here, or standing here. And this past few weeks, it's been hard for my wife because she learned that her mom has a, a lesion on her brain. That the doctors discovered, they, they did x-rays, they found a lesion on her brain. And currently it's not cancerous, praise God. But it is going to cause some complications. And truth be told is that it could possibly affect the length of her life. And you know, when you, you go through something like that, and somebody you love and care about dearly, you start to see their morale or mortality. It really hits you that we don't have a lot of time to save them. And yet I believe that Kelly's mom's situation is no different than every other person on earth. That every single person is somebody's mother, somebody's father, somebody's brother, somebody's sister. And if they're not saved by the time they die, there's no hope for them to make it to heaven. And we can't get sentimental about that message. We can't get sentimental about the truth that the world is lost. You know, I really appreciate uh, our church interns. You know, we have incredible staff here at church, and several of them work full time and fund themselves in the ministry. I really appreciate Amber, I appreciate Kevin and Brittany, and I really appreciate Liz as well, as well as Isaiah. And Liz, let's just say she's working full time and working for the church full time, but she's not paid by the church currently. Out of nowhere, now Liz is, Liz is, if I could say this, she's dead broke. She's dead broke. Like there's, there's dead, and then there's like buried in the ground for years. Skeleton, just nothing but remains left, dead, dead broke. And yeah, she called me this past week and she goes, hey, I'm raising my contribution. Nobody asked her. Out of nowhere, she goes, hey, I want to get more. And I appreciate it because it's things like that that I think really show the heart of our staff. They show the heart of people like Liz. That without asking, she goes, I want to do more. And I think it shows that she's made Canada her home and that she has a heart to see this nation evangelized. And, um, <clears throat> you know, this past week we were sitting down with both Liz and Isaiah, and, and there was something big on, on Liz's heart. And, you know, you can sometimes tell when you're having tea time with somebody that there's something big on their heart. They're just not fired up. And you can talk and you can talk, but they just for some reason there's just something not quite right. And so we're talking and talking, and finally it comes out. She goes, you know, I've been here for a while, and I don't feel like I've really been that fruitful. And the scripture that we, we referenced was John 15, verse 8, where it says, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit. Now, it's debated by people as to what kind of fruit Jesus was referring to right there in John 15. Was Jesus referring to the fruits of the Spirit? Or was Jesus referring to the fruit of one disciple making another disciple? Well, let's just think about this for a second. If you're an apple tree and you bear fruit, what kind of fruit do you bear? An apple. I've never seen an apple tree bear fruit to a grape. 
You with me right here? If you're a banana tree and you bear fruit, what kind of fruit do you bear? Banana. A banana. It's an amazing concept. Now, if you're a horse and you bear fruit, what are you going to bear fruit to? Another horse. You know, I never forget, I was sharing this concept in our church in San Diego. And I was going, okay, guys, what kind of fruit do apple trees produce? Everybody goes, apples. I go, okay, what kind of fruit does banana trees produce? Bananas. I go, what kind of fruit does horses produce? Everybody goes, cows. I go, what kind of fruit do, or, or excuse me, horses. I go, what kind of fruit does cows produce? And this one sister goes, milk. <laughs> Dead serious. The whole church just started laughing. No. The fruit of disciples is more disciples. You with me here? But truth be told, I, I was sharing this with Liz and Isaiah. I go, truth be told, you can't bear the fruit of disciples without the fruits of the Holy Spirit. I mean, you go out and try and make a disciple without love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and self-control. <laughs> You'd be a disciple right now, buddy. If, if you don't look spiritual, you're never going to be effective at helping somebody else be spiritual. It's just a, it's a natural thing that occurs within each and every one of us. If you're not doing it, you can't give somebody what you don't have. And if you're not spiritual, you can't help somebody be spiritual. If you don't have love, you can't help somebody have love. If you don't have faith, good luck getting somebody else to have faith. You've got to have the fruits of the Spirit so that you can bear spiritual fruit of making disciples. You with me? And I go, sis, I think that you've got to just work on the fruits of the Spirit. I think that if you crucify yourself, deny yourself, and learn to be more spiritual, then God is going to work in your ministry, and you're going to see a lot of fruit made as a disciple. Amen, church? See, at the end of the day, the multiplication comes after the crucifixion. You've got to die to multiply. Our last point this morning, crucified to testify. Let's go to John chapter 12, verse 27. I don't want to go too long. I know Brandon's always hungry for lunch. <laughs> is, it, is it all right, bro, if I keep going? All right. He says it's okay. He's my barometer. When I see Brandon starting to get sleepy, I go, okay, I'm going too long. Sometimes it's only like five minutes, so I got to be a little careful. John chapter 12, verse 27. He says, my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason that I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. You know, it's an interesting point. God only spoke to Jesus from heaven three times while Jesus was on earth. We well, you know the first time was when Jesus got baptized. God said, this is my son whom I love, with whom I'm well pleased. The second time God spoke to Jesus was when Jesus was transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration. That he showed his disciples his glorified form. And this is the third time right here as Jesus was preparing to go to the cross. And in each time was a moment where Jesus was all about glorifying God. And this is where God spoke and says, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was theirs heard it and said, it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was not for me, this is for you. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. You know, at the end of the day, Jesus knew that by going to the cross, that that act in and of itself would be the biggest testament and testimony of God's love towards us that ever existed. That that act of crucifixion would be the only testimony that Jesus would ever need from that time into eternity. And so for us, as Jesus was crucified to testify, so too we need to be crucified to testify. Look over in Luke 23. Here we find Jesus, 
No longer metaphorically on the cross, but now literally on the cross. Verse 32, it says, Two other men, both criminals, were also let out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, Golgotha, they crucified him there with the other criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at Jesus. They said he saved others. Let him save himself, if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung their hold insults said, aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you're under the same sentence? We are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said to Jesus, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. You know, this is an incredible account. While Jesus is on the cross, the Bible says that the crowds were looking on and, and some of them even started to shout out to Jesus, Come down from the cross and save yourself. The irony of the statement is inescapable as, number one, Jesus was on the cross to save them, never to save himself. But number two, Jesus was the Messiah because he went to the cross. And if he stopped going to the cross, if he took himself down from that cross, he would no longer be the Messiah and no longer be the Savior. But here's the reality. The world is always going to ask you to get down from your cross and join the rest of them. And so here they are, even though they're the ones that put Jesus on the cross, they ask him to come back down. See, this morning I've got to ask, have you gotten down from your cross? You know, the Bible says that as they're hanging there on the cross, one of the criminals mocked Jesus, but the other one looked at Jesus and said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. You know, once again, I think Luke's account leaves out an important fact. And so turn with me to Matthew chapter 27. Most of us, I think, would look at these two criminals. One was, yeah, he's a criminal, but he is a pretty bad guy as well. And the other one, he is a criminal, but, but you know, he turned out to be a pretty good guy. But Matthew's account, I think, records it slightly differently. It says in verse 38, of Matthew 27, two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Skip on down to verse 44. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. You know, what strikes me is that Jesus was only on the cross for a few hours. Although most people think that there was one good criminal and one bad criminal, we find right here that they both started out bad. They were both mocking Jesus. They were both insulting Jesus. And somehow, in that short period of time that Jesus was on the cross with both of them, his life transformed the heart of one of the criminals. You know, I wondered, how did he do it? Did, did Jesus say something to him? Did he intellectually try to challenge him and logically try to change his belief system? Well, no, because the Bible records that Jesus only spoke seven shortened senses, and none of them were to this man before he said, come and be with me in paradise. Did, did Jesus do something? Did he serve him? Did he wash his feet? Did he go and help him out? Did he heal him? Well, no. He was on the cross the whole time, just like the thief was. And so what was it that ultimately changed the heart of this hardened criminal? It was simply Jesus' attitude. The fact that Jesus not only was on the cross, but he was still carrying his cross spiritually. You see, when the, when the soldiers started to steal Jesus' clothes, Jesus didn't get upset. He said, forgive them. When people were mock mocking him and insulting him, he didn't get angry. When they told him to come down from the cross, he stayed on the cross. He was surrendered to the cross and he carried his cross, both physically and metaphorically, and through carrying his cross. He won over 
the thief on the cross. You know, I want to leave you with this point. I don't think that this thief on the cross was any more open than all the people that you and I meet in Toronto. I don't think the thief on the cross was any more receptive to the scriptures than any of the people that you and I meet in the, 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 the nation of Canada. I don't think the thief on the cross was a better person than any of the people that you and I meet in this city. Maybe the challenge of us bearing fruit is not people being less like the thief, but maybe it's us being more like Jesus. And if we could be more like Jesus, if we could have that attitude, if we could have his heart, his desire to carry our cross and to be on the cross, then I believe that there will be lots of thieves on the cross that come down from the cross and join us in the faith. You with me right here? What's the challenge this morning? Take up your cross. I want to challenge us to be crucified to glorify. I want to challenge us to be crucified to multiply. And I want to challenge us to be crucified to testify. I want to challenge you to take up your cross. For Jesus already took up his. And with that this morning, let's go to God in prayer for communion.